You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Weekly Business Hour. I'm Rick Schisler. I'm your host. I'm also a Silver Fox advisor and the founder of OneBestConsult.com. We're broadcasting from the studios of Lone Star Community Radio, located in Conroe, Texas, the fastest growing city in the country, according to the United States Census Bureau, for cities under 100,000. So as you can imagine, lots of business going on here in Conroe, Montgomery County, Texas. First question of the day for you. I always like to lead off with a quick question, maybe stimulate a little thinking. My question today is, have you seen the change yet? Lots of change going on around us with the lifting of the pandemic restrictions. Businesses are reopening, businesses are expanding, more folks can go to a restaurant, all kinds of things are happening. And my question still stands, have you seen the change yet in your business, your industry, your market? It's important to take a little bit of time to identify what is happening in your business, not just within your doors, but in your neighborhood, your community, the area that you serve. Very important to keep your eyes and ears open because they have, pro the economists have forecasted tremendous growth. And if you don't want to miss the opportunities, if you don't want to be oversupplied with inventory and get caught short or with too much, you need to take time to analyze because it's going to be a fast moving situation, at least according to the economists. So answer the question. Take a look for the change in your business, your industry, your marketplaces, and see what it is that you need to be prepared for in the next month, six months, 12 months. I think we're going to see a lot of dramatic change. It'll be positive, more positive if you're prepared for it. The weekly business hour is where Montgomery County and businesses now throughout the world come to talk about the latest in business news, ideas to improve their business, and to be part of a conversation that can make a real biz difference in your business today. At least that's what we hope for. We try to provide speakers, guests, and information that you can use in your business today. And I want to remind you, this show is broadcast live on YouTube and Facebook. So if you want to watch as well as listen, just simply go to Facebook, YouTube, click on the weekly business hour page and you'll see a button there. You want to listen to live, we're there for your enjoyment. So please do that. Well, today I'm going to share a recent conversation I had with Michelle Seiler Tucker, who is one of the leading providers of mergers and acquisition services for small businesses. Michelle's company offers a variety of services for small businesses, including business evaluation, business planning and implementation, and brokering the sale of your business. It seems to me their goal is to help you maximize the return to you and your business when it comes time to exit your business. You can find out more information about Michelle and her firm at www. Siler, S-E-I-L-E-R, Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R.com. That's SilerTucker.com. And I encourage you to take it, a look at it. It's got some interesting information that I guarantee I hadn't even thought about when it comes to the sale of a business in the United States today. So check it out. At this point, real simple. Just sit back, pull out your pad and pen or your computer, and listen and hear my conversation, my recent conversation, with Michelle Seiler Tucker. This recording, again, may be found on YouTube on the Weekly Business Hour cha channel, so enjoy. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today with Michelle Seiler Tucker. She's the founder and CEO of Seiler Tucker Incorporated. And as I did my introduction earlier, she has done it all, in my opinion, in business. Written a couple great books that capture, I think, some of the essence important issues in business today. Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me on. I well, it. let's get started in the beginning. I mean, you, you have such a wonderful experience, very rich experience in the uh, M&A business, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, what drew you to that area uh, some 20 plus years ago? 
Yep. So I've, I've always been interested and passionate about small business. I have owned many different businesses and many different verticals um, as, a, as a young adult. And um, I did kind of get st stuck into working for corporate America. I actually got recruited by Xerox and they actually recruited me from their competitor because they couldn't beat me. <laughs> And they figured out, they got their team of lawyers on it to figure out how to get around their non-compete, my non-compete. Anyway, so went to work for Xerox, was there for about six months. My nickname became The Closer. So every time, you know, somebody couldn't close a deal, they're like, well, give Michelle to do it. She can do it. She can close anything. She's a closer. And then within six months, my supervisor came to me and said, you know, they have a position opening up for the regional vice president position at Xerox, you really should, you know, interview for it. She said, it's going to be a three month grueling process and you probably won't get it because Xerox's policy is they don't promote without being there at least two years. And you're up against a bunch of other, you know, Xeroxes have been there for years and years. And so I'm like, why would I try out for something I'm not going to get? It sounds like a colossal waste of time. And she's like, no, you it's the experience. You'll learn so much going through this experience. And I said, okay, so she was right. I went through this grueling three month period with all the high level executives where you got to do the Q and A's and presentations and copier demonstrations, et cetera. Well, I ended up getting it, even though I was told I would never get it. So I guess I truly am the closer. <laughs> and I got promoted from sales to, to, um, to vice president over, over hundred salespeople very quickly and found out very quickly, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I didn't like it, I like management. I like leadership. What I don't like is corporate management because they have meetings to have meetings, to have a follow-up meeting, you know, to plan the next meeting. And it's just so much red tape and you can never make a decision. And, and, you know, I like, I like finding out the problem, come up with solutions, implementing it and building lifetime relationships with my customers. So very quickly I realized that's not for me. And, you know, business owners should never do that. They should never take their closer. <laughs> <laughs> and promote them to upper management. So I ended up saying, gosh, what am I going to do? I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I didn't want to go backwards. So I ended up getting into franchise sales, franchise consulting, franchise development. Also uh, became an equity partner with a franchisor and sold hundreds and hundreds of franchises. And I kept having clients say, buyers ask me, well, do you have an existing business? You know, I don't want to buy a franchise. I don't want the franchise model. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And then finally, I'm like, why am I saying no, no, no? I should be saying yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so that's really how I transitioned into selling businesses. Um, first, small businesses, um, you know, restaurants, coffee shops, dry cleaners, flower shops, and then within a year, I transitioned to selling businesses, ten million dollars and up. And then I learned very quickly that what Steve Forbes says is true: eight out of ten businesses will not sell. So eighty percent of businesses are not selling. So I'm like, gosh, if I don't start fixing them, <laughs> if I don't start, you know, tweaking them, growing them, put them on a build to sell plan, then I'm going to starve to death. So that's really how I transitioned into buying, selling, fixing, growing. My firm has sold over a thousand businesses and I partner with business owners. I own a business right there in, in, in Houston, Texas, um, that they called me to, to sell their business and their business is not sellable because they are the business. And um, so I partnered with them, uh, investing my time, energy, uh, expertise, and money, of course. Also buy businesses and flip them. We merge businesses, we sell businesses. And, you know, I've been doing that for a little over 20 years, over a thousand transactions. Well, and obviously that gives you a wonderful background. And you have a book that came out not too long ago called Exit Rich. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that book. Sure. You know, I, I decided to write Exit Rich because I wrote my first book in 2013 called Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth. And Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth was really more of a blueprint about how to sell your business. One of, some of the research I did back then was businesses that open and close. So back then, it was 95% of all startups will go out of business. So those one to five years are the most risky. You know that, right? We all know that. That's common knowledge. However, when I wrote Exit Rich, and the reason I wrote Exit Rich is because I noticed that, gosh, I'd be in Houston. I drive past a strip center, and then I drive by a month later, they're out of business. So I started doing research for Exit Rich and learned that the business landscape has actually flip-flopped. So now it's only 30% of startups will go out of business. But out of 27.6 million companies, 
those businesses have been in business 10 years or longer, 70% of those businesses will go out of business. Seven zero. So you can see the business landscape has flip-flopped. And you hear about the big public companies like Toys R Us in business 75 years goes out of business. Kmart, JC Penney's, Montgomery Ward, Godiva is closing down 1,500 locations. GNC is closing down 900 locations. But what you don't hear about are the private businesses on every street corner, in every town, in every state across our great nation. Unfortunately, these business owners are exiting poor. They're selling for pennies on the dollar. They're closing their businesses. They're filing bankruptcy. And that's very sad to me because, you know, business owners, we make huge sacrifices. We pour our heart, our energy, our soul, our money. You know, I've talked to business owners that haven't taken a vacation in nine years. I talked to a business owner, owner the other day. He's like, Michelle, I've missed every single one of my kids' events. So it's sad that so many business owners are exiting poor. It's sad that 70% of businesses are going out of business after being in business 10 years. And there's a reason for that. The number one reason for that is because of, I call it lack of aim. Aim is A-I-M, always innovate and market. They stopped innovating. Look at Blockbuster. They saw Netflix. They had an opportunity to buy Netflix. They sat back that and happy and did nothing. So you have to innovate. Business owners stop innovating. You know, they're married to the way that they've always done things. They're married to the original concept. And you can't do that. You, you either grow or dying. There's no in between. Well, I think you make some wonderful points. And I happen to agree because of my experience as a serial entrepreneur, so to speak, growing up in a family business. And I've been able to see firsthand many of the things you talk about. Now, one of the things that you do uh, is you educate someone. I mean, you're not just a, you're not a business broker. You get into your in the business, kind of roll up your sleeves, if you will, mm -hmm. and get involved with people. Talk about how that is so important when you go to sell your business. Yeah, the reason that so well, you got to think about why are eighty percent of businesses not selling? Well, because they're not sellable, <laughs> and the reason they're not sellable is because most business owners never think about selling their business until a catastrophic oh. event occurs, internal or external, internal health issues, partner disputes, divorce death, you know, external, this pandemic. And that's the worst time to sell your business because your business is typically trending downward. The best time to sell your business is when it's booming. But, and so because business owners don't think about selling their business, they really haven't built a business that somebody actually wants to buy. So we really roll up our sleeves and take business owners through a process. And that first process is what I call the ST GPS exit model. Why I tell business owners, look, <laughs> you uh, entrepreneurs, you got to plan your exit from day one of starting or buying a business. Well, because a lot of business owners never think about it. Like they're so busy in the day to day. They're so busy in the transactional that they never think about the end game. So do you want me to go into the GPS exit model? Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a quick break? Sure. And when we come back, let's start off with that, because I think that's a wonderful tool, a uh, wonderful guide for someone. In what can the Better Living for Texans program do for you? You can learn how to increase your consumption of fruits and vegetables, choose foods that are relatively inexpensive and good to eat, make your food dollars last longer, prepare quick, nutritious meals, help your children learn how to eat healthier snacks and much more. Our program is committed to helping people like you improve your health through providing research-based nutrition education in a friendly, cost-free, and relaxed environment. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. Hey y'all, it's DJ Mike from Dan Simon, Texas. Join me Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. as I count down the top 10 Texas Red Dirt songs that are packing the dance floor. I'll be featuring local artists and the story behind the hits, shows in the area, as well as new songs that make you want to dance. It's Dance Time in Texas with DJ Mike on Lone Star Community Radio, 104.5 KCZW and 106.1 KZCC, Conroe, Texas, or online, IRLoneStar.com. Don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That's Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on the computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. A Lone Star Community Radio. Broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. 
Well, I hope you're enjoying the conversation we're having with Michelle today. I think it's interesting and very informative and a conversation that I really, really enjoyed personally because it was full of information that I think could benefit anyone that owns a business today. But aside from that, let me mention to you, I try to remind people constantly when I can, if you have a question that comes up in the conversation today with Michelle or a question about the show or a comment, please send those to me. It's real easy. Just send me an email at one, that's the number one, bestconsult at gmail.com. That's one, bestconsult at gmail.com. We're having a conversation, as I mentioned, with an expert today, Michelle Seiler Tucker, who is one of the leading providers of mergers and acquisition services for small businesses. Michelle's company offers a variety of services, including business evaluation, business planning, and implementation, as well as brokering the sale of your business. And so at this point, again, kick back, pull out your pad and pen to take some notes or use your computer, and you'll hear a continuation of our conversation with an expert, Michelle Seiler Tucker. Well, Michelle, welcome back. Uh, we are geared up for the second part of our discussion today, and we'll talk about that model that you've developed. Lead us through that, would you? Absolutely. So I call this the ST, ST Seller Tucker, <laughs> ST GPS exit model. And like I said, most business owners don't plan the end game. You know, they, they don't think about the end game. So when you want to drive somewhere, what's the first thing you do? You pull out your phone, you go to you go to Google Maps, right? And you plug in your destination. If you don't plug in a destination, you're going to be driving around in circles. <laughs> and that's what happens to business owners. They don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. So because they don't have a destination, they don't have an end game. They just drive around in circles. They drop up and down those financial hills to, to unfortunately end up exiting poor. So the first thing they have to figure out is what's my destination? What's my end game? What's my desired sales price? What do I want to sell my company for? And you should do this day one. And everybody gets hung up on a number. So it's a number, pick a number, you know, <laughs> you might hit it, you might not, you know, you might surpass it. So pick a number. Let's say you want to sell for $20 million. There's a number, right? Now, what does a GPS need to know? It needs to know where you're starting from. What's your current location? In other words, what's your current evaluation? And so many business owners have no idea what their business is worth. Many business owners have never had a business evaluation. And that's quite shocking to me. Because as humans, we go get an annual physical checkup once a year to make sure our heart's still ticking and we're still kicking. <laughs> we'll drive our car to the, to the shop to make sure we get an annual tune-up on our car. But we don't take our most valuable asset and get an annual valuation checkup. That's financial suicide. You should know what your business is worth every year because there are events that can increase your valuation and events that can decrease your valuation. You know, that, so, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I just want to stop you for a second because sure. I want folks to understand that, that checking in on your business, as I call it, is, is a must do. Uh, even yeah. if you're not worried about the exit, which I happen to agree with you, you need to be focused on the exit along with so many other things. But the idea of the sustainability of your business, just like you mentioned, the automobile, your own personal health, it's a right. great point. Thanks. And they need that evaluation checkup. So you need an annual evaluation checkup. We, we do this with our clients. They come in for the initial evaluation. And then once a year, we have the evaluation checkup. So we run through it real quick. We run through the evaluation, see if it increased. We run through the projections. We get a lender pre-qualified. We do all that stuff just to make sure that they're on target for their end game. And here's the bottom line. If you never sell your business, that it doesn't really matter. What matters is you actually have a valuable asset to sell if you need to sell one day. I had a sweet little old lady call me from Dallas and she was in her, I don't know, seventies. And she said, my husband dropped out of a heart attack, left me with a mountain of debt. And I really need you to help me sell this business. So I started asking her questions. He owns a construction company. He had no employees, no people, just subcontractors, no processes. When he died, the business died. There was nothing to sell. So you always want to make sure you have an asset to sell because nothing lasts forever, right? Nothing lasts forever. So back to the valuation. So let's say you're worth $5 million. You want to sell for $20 million, you're worth $5 million. Great. Now we have a start of a plan. We need to reverse engineer it. Then you need to determine 
time frame. What time frame do you want to do this? Let's say you want to do it in 10 years. Then it's very important for you to determine who your buyers are going to be. Not buyer, buyers. So many sellers come to me and say, Michelle, I just need you to represent me with this one buyer. And I'm like, that's a mistake. And I go, why? And I said, because you got a 98% chance that that buyer's not going to buy your business. <laughs> and so you have no backup buyers. You don't want to put all your eggs in one buyer's basket. And then not only that, how do you get maximum value, the highest price, if you don't have any competition? So we need to create competition. We need to have multiple buyers looking at your business. And so there's five types of buyers. So if you're trying to sell for $20 million, I'll tell you who your buyers are not going to be. It's not going to be a first-time buyer because they buy small businesses. They leave corporate America and they buy small businesses. And 90% of buyers are first-time buyers. It's not going to be a turnaround specialist because they buy distressed assets. So it's probably going to be a PEG, a private equity group. They buy based upon platforms and add-ons. Or a strategic slash competitor. They typically will pay the highest multiple because they're taking advantage of economies of scale. They can typically cut overhead with the infrastructure they already have in place, and they pay a higher multiple for synergies. The synergies that can catapult their business to the next level. The synergies that can maybe open up doors for them that they're not currently in. And then the last type of buyer is a sophisticated buyer, a serial entrepreneur. They're industry agnostic. They chase cash flow. They chase EBITDA. So now once you know, okay, out of these five, it's probably going to be these three types of buyers. Where do the financials need to be? If I want to sell for $20 million, where's the gross revenues need to be? Where's the gross profit margin, I mean, the, the profit margins, the EBITDA, or needs before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, where does that need to be? And then I, I will tell you, if you want to sell for $20 million, you need to have an EBITDA between $3 million and $5 million, depending upon your synergies. Then you need to know, well, what characteristics are these buyers looking for? What synergies are they looking for? What will make them pay top dollar for my business? And then you build that business based upon those specific criteria. This is an actual plan. <laughs> and then the last step in that plan is why. The why is so important because it's all about mindset. If it was easy to sell a business for $20 million, everybody would be doing it. So you have to have a powerful why to keep you in the game, to keep you motivated, to keep you weathering all the financial storms, and to keep you in the game. So that's the GPS exit model. Then I take people through what I call the infrastructure on the six piece. And you, you absolutely, and I, and I have to make this comment, maybe it's unobvious, but you put a plan to it because, you know, I find it so interesting when I talk to business owners that their exit or what they begin that conversation say, well, I want to sell the business and retire, or I maybe want to sell and buy another business in, in a different area. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is if they have no plan to get there, then mm -hmm. they don't put the business in a position to maximize or to even return the kind of money they're looking for. I find yeah. this all the time, all the time. Yeah. Or they come up, what happens is when they finally think about selling, they'll come to me and say, well, I want to sell for $10 million. I'm like, great. How'd you come up with that value? Because I always ask them, what do you want to sell for? Because I want to take their temperature. <laughs> I want to see how realistic they are. And I'm like, how did you come up with $10 million? And they go, well, that's what I need. That's what I need to retire on. Or that's what I need to put five girls through college and pay for five girls' weddings. So, or that's what I need to start my next, you know, or buy my next business. So buyers don't care about what you need. Buyers care about the value that it brings them. And so a lot of times, you know, most, a lot of business owners are extremely unrealistic on, on what the purchase price should be of their business because they don't base it on the value of the business. They base it upon what their needs are. And that's why it's so important to say, okay, well, if you really want $10 million, let's build a $10 million company and get you to exit for $10 million. But you're not just going to wake up one day and say, I need $10 million and bingo, go sell your business and get $10 million. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. And that brings into, into play another issue is that you can't just wake up one day and say, I want to sell my business, right? It's got yep. to be over a period of time that allows these things to, to happen. Absolutely. Well, and a lot of business owners will say, well, I'm like three years out. I'll call you, you know, two and a half years. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not enough time. We have to start planning now. You know, we have to get your financials in order now. It, on average, it takes a year to sell a business. Some sell quicker, some take longer. And in the case of someone who's trying to build a business to sell, it could take 20 years 
to put it in that say ten million dollar range that they expect to get out of it. And uh, it's amazing uh, decisions that are made every day, every year in your planning that impact that number. And uh, you've got to have a plan. I had a client one time that uh, wanted to sell a business. They built it up. It was a family. They were from France. I uh, had a great business. It, 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 we happened to be in a recession. Their business was one of the few that worked very well in a recession. And yeah. But they had just started a trajectory that was almost straight up with yeah. profitability. And I counseled them and said, go for three years, you know, work yeah. this profitability. You'll be amazed how much money that you can get over and above what you would get today where you're just at the bottom of the curve. Right. And, but they woke up one day, wanted to sell their business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's what happens, you know, because they get tired of it or, you know, they, they get burned out. They get, they get, they don't want to do it anymore. Like I said, I, you know, something happened, you know, look, things don't stay forever, right? What goes up must come down, you know? So it's really imperative to, to plan that. It's the most, it, it's, it strikes me as, as being so odd because we plan for our children. You have children, right? I do have six. And Well, I have one, six. Uh, that's not, that's not, that's, that's a circus. <laughs> So you got to plan for your circus, right? You find on where do they go to elementary? Where do, where do they go to preschool, elementary, high school, uh, middle school, high school, college? You know how many grandkids are going to give you, right? But we don't plan for the most valuable asset in our life, which is our business. Well, and you make an excellent point on that. One of the things that intrigues me, you're in the merger and acquisition business. So a lot of times, uh, small business people, don't think of merger or acquisition, sale of their business. If I am looking for someone to help me, to represent me like mm -hmm. yourself, what are some of the key attributes I need to look for? So number one, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter where the advisor is located because even before the pandemic, we're selling businesses all over the United States. We've sold businesses in Canada, Trinidad, um, Colombia, you know, um, now we're talking to people in Dubai. So we can sell businesses all over, especially with the power of the internet. So location doesn't matter. What matters is experience, you know, and there's a difference between a broker, a business broker, and an advisor, an M&A advisor. Mergers and acquisitions advisors typically do metal market, whereas business brokers do pizzerias, coffee shops, restaurants. And that's, you know, that's okay. There's, you know, that's okay. That's just a difference, right? And so you really, you know, if, what are you trying to sell? If you're trying to sell a larger business, you want to make sure you do your homework, do your research, make sure that the person has years of experience, you know, at least 10 years plus, make sure that they have sold lots of businesses, you know, um, over a hundred, make sure that they have experience in a lot of different verticals. You don't have to be, have specific industry experience because, that doesn't really matter. You don't have to have the ex industry experience, but you should have experience in many different verticals. And then you want to make sure <clears throat> that they have a buyer's database. <clears throat> we have over 28,000 buyers. We work with about 3,000 private equity groups. You want to know, you know, tell me about your buyers. How do you find your buyers? How do you attract buyers? You know, we run a query in our buyer database first before we even put a business on the market. A lot of times we have buyers right in our own database that we don't have to put it on the market. And then you want to know, you know, um, do you have any business experience? Because I think when I think if an advisor has actually owned businesses before, it gives them that competitive edge because they've sat on the other side of the desk. They've made the tough decisions. They've I've sold many of my own businesses, you know, so it gives them that real competitive edge to, to be able to see things more clearly and, and be empathetic and, you know, be able to see both sides, buyer and seller. Um, so I think that's important. And then also, how do you evaluate a business? I mean, a lot of brokers, advisors just say, oh, you want $10 million? No problem. Write it up and they stick it on the market. I have a girlfriend of mine in Houston that as a broker, and I went with her on a couple of deals and I was appalled <laughs> by the way she does her business, by the way she runs her company. And, you know, we went out to a couple of different um, engagement meetings and the, one, I remember one deal, he said, well, I want 15 million. She goes, okay. She writes it up for 15 million. She doesn't even do an evaluation. She didn't none of that. And I go, it, you're just, an, you're being an order taker. 
You're not being an advisor. It's your job to educate. It's your job to run a thorough evaluation. And then she says, well, I let my buyers do the education because when my buyers come in and keep telling them, well, it's not worth this, it's not worth this, and I'll be more realistic. I'm like, that's a lot of legwork and a total colossal waste of time. And you're not really, you know, you don't have your client's best interest in mind. So anyway, you know, you, you really got to make sure, like I said, they have that experience. They've sold lots of businesses. Who owns a firm too? Because you want to know who determines the budget. Who determines how much money gets spent on what business? And if you if you have an advisor that only has a couple of years of experience, but then the owner has, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of experience, then you might be okay working with that advisor, right? So there's a lot of different things, but you really want to know about valuations. How do they evaluate a business? How do they arrive at the numbers? You know, have they ever um, conducted an auction before? Have they done a structured auction? Have they um, created bidding wars? Those are the questions you want to ask. Well, and it, again, it all makes a lot of sense and it sounds very thorough. Uh, if we could just take a, we'll take a short break here, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we'll be back with you because I really want to get into, if you don't mind, the evaluation of a business, because I think that it helps a business owner understand what, what really is taking place here. Sure. Vell Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit, began in 2014 with a mission to strengthen the future of veterans through leadership and entrepreneurship training. We've invested over 1,400 hours of training in our veterans while connecting them with community entrepreneurs and leaders. Our mission is to continue investing in our veterans who have given so much for our country. Please join us on our mission by visiting vellinstitute.org. That's V-E-L institute.org. Second Saturday Divorce Workshop provides unbiased information to help you understand your options and move forward with your life. This divorce workshop is for you if you are contemplating divorce, in the process of divorce, already filed for divorce, or post-divorce. You will explore the emotional, legal, and financial aspects of divorce from professionals who have guided others through divorce. For more information on this divorce workshop, contact SecondSaturdayWoodlands.com or call 832-375-0900. Do you want to know what's going on in Conroe? Tune in to Keeping Up with Conroe. Keeping Up with Conroe will highlight upcoming events and local businesses in the area. Keeping Up with Conroe will air the second Tuesday of every month at 11 a.m. and will be hosted by the Conroe CVB staff. Keeping Up with Conroe will highlight Conroe's amazing attractions for residents and visitors. So tune in to Keeping Up with Conroe and join the staff of the Conroe CVB every month on Lone Star Community Radio. For more information about keeping up with Conroe and the Conroe CVB, go to visitconroe.com. Well, I hope you're enjoying the conversation, Michelle. We're coming up shortly. It'll be our third part of the conversation, and we'll wrap it up shortly. But before we do, I want to remind you, if you have a business here in the Montgomery County area, the Conroe area, uh, think about offering uh, a sponsorship to the weekly business hour. We are looking for sponsors for our program. Uh, Lone Star Community uh, Radio is a nonprofit, so as a sponsor, you're contributing to the ability to produce and distribute shows such as the Weekly Business Hour, so I would appreciate it if you would like to do that, particularly for the Weekly Business Hour, just drop me an email here at the station, rick at irlonestar.com, that's rick at irlonestar.com, and we'd love to count you as one of the sponsors of the Weekly Business Hour. So as I mentioned earlier, Let's go back and hear, listen with me, the final part of our conversation with Michelle Seiler Tucker on exiting rich from your business. Well, Michelle, thank you again for taking time to visit with us. And there's one thing that I really would like you to address because you, you've done it uh, in your book and other places and uh, so well, and that's the evaluation and you use a method called the six P's. Talk to us a little bit about that method and why it's so important that the business owner go through this process. Sure, absolutely. So the six P's are really the six cylinders. You know, the car has to run on six cylinders. If not, you're gonna have a slow engine, right? <laughs> Same thing with your business. You gotta build the infrastructure. And so the, and when we look at evaluations, you know, there's, there's six different things we look at. We look at the asset approach. We look at discounted cash flow, markets, SODs, industry standards, um, future cash, and what I call the six Ps. 
So the six Ps are these synergies that buyers will pay more money for. And if you, if you don't have them, a lot of buyers won't even buy your business. If you have them and all of, you operate on all six Ps, then we'll get you a much higher multiple. So the first P is what I call people. You, you don't build a business, you build people and people build the business. One of the number one reasons that businesses don't sell is because the owner is the business. I pull the owner out, there is no company. You know, we have a dentist that came to us, been in business 45 years, three dental hygienist. And he's like, Michelle, I want to sell. And I'm like, great, I can sell you, but you're going to have to stay for a little while. <laughs> you have to stay for like two years. And he goes, I'm not staying. I go, well, then your business is not sellable because you are the business. You leave, the patients leave. So people is huge. You got to have the right people in the right seats. You got to ask, you got to focus on your strengths, hire your weaknesses and ask the who question, Rick, who opens the door, who, who handles customer service, who handles marketing, legal, accounting, logistics, manufacturing, environmental. The clue here, Rick, is you should never be next to the who. Because <laughs> you really want to build that business to run without you. And if you're trying to sell a $10 million, $20 million company, you need to have a layer of management. All right. And so then the second P is product. You know, you have to look at your product, your industry, your service and say, okay, is my product industry on the way up or on the way out? Is it thriving, dying? Do I have an Amazon or a Blockbuster? And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, a lot of industries that were thriving are now dying. So if you're in a dying industry, that doesn't mean that you go home and, and quit. That means that you really have to, here, I'll give you another P, pivot. <laughs> you really have to pivot. And I always tell my clients, ask these three transformational questions. Amazon did this back in the 90s. Ask yourself, what business are you in? Amazon said, I'm in the book selling business. We sell books. What do we do really, really well, better than anybody? We do fulfillment better than anybody. And then the third question, most important question is, what business should we be in? And they said, we should be in a fulfillment business. <laughs> so, you know, fulfilling everybody's products. So those three transformational questions took Amazon from a small bookseller to a multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate that they are today. So product is huge. You know, 70% of these businesses are going out of business because they stopped innovating. So you always got to innovate. You always got to diversify. You're either growing or dying. The third P is processes. Processes are big because you'll never build a sustainable business that's scalable if you don't have processes. But processes are kind of like exit strategy. Nobody thinks about it until something bad happens. <laughs> you know, we're selling a manufacturing um, company and one of the employees got, got hurt on the manufacturing floor. It's actually a catastrophic event. The company's getting sued. They're probably going to end up following bankruptcy. This is going to destroy the company. And the owner said to me, he says, well, we need a process for health and safety in this department. I'm like, you think you needed that before? <laughs> So you really want to think about your processes from the beginning, from starting or buying a business. And here's where most people get it wrong, Rick. Most business owners design the processes around their own agenda. You need to design the processes around the customer experience, what you want the customer to experience. For instance, chiropractors. They're like, okay, our hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are 9 to 12, and then we come back at 3, and then we're there to 5.30, and then Tuesdays is 10 to 12, and Thursday – they're not taking into consideration the customer experience, right? They're making it all about their own agenda. McDonald's started McDonald's. The McDonald brothers started McDonald's back in the 40s. And they said, we want to design a fast food restaurant around the customer experience. The processes have to be designed around the customer experience, which is serve great tasting food that's hot fast. They never said it's going to be organic or healthy. <laughs> and, and because of their processes, even though they've been tweaked along the way, is why you can eat at a McDonald's anywhere in the world and always get the same experience. A lot of business owners, big companies, banks, social media companies, it's so difficult. The processes are so terribly designed that it does the opposite and infuriates clients. Like, for instance, if you've ever been on the phone with a bank and you have to push all these different prompts to even get a person on the phone or you got to talk to 10 different people 10 different times to get your problem resolved. So you really need to design your process with the customer experience in mind. They need to be efficient, productive, and most important, you need to have these policies and procedure manuals. You need to have non-competes. When buyers come in to buy your business, they're not going to buy your business if you don't have non-competes, employment contracts, SOP checklists, and policy and procedure manuals. The fourth piece, so this is where valuation really comes in. Now, all the other three Ps are important, but the four P is if you're if you're if you have an EBIT of under a million dollars, your multiple in all likelihood is going to be under five. 
if you have an EBITDA of over a million dollars, you have a lot more buyers. There are more buyers for good businesses than there are good businesses to buy. So your multiples typically are going to be five and up depending upon these synergies. So this is proprietary. Now this takes me the longest out of every P. The other two P's are quick. There are six pillars to proprietary. Number one is branding. The more well-branded you are, the more I can sell your company for. As long as your brand is relevant in the mind of the consumer. Is anybody paying any money for Blockbuster? No. The largest brand in the world, the most valuable brand in the world is, do you know? Well, I can't imagine. I mean, large company, no. It's got to be something that we wouldn't think of. Amazon is a great brand. Ap uh, Apple. 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 Wonderful Apple. brand, yeah. $249 billion. That's just the brand. That's not assets, inventory, real estate, cash, anything else. That's just the brand. So build your brand, build your value. Trademarks are huge. Mistake the business owners make is let's say they open up a business in Texas. They go get a Texas, they go get a trademark in Texas, but they never check the federal database to make sure that company name is available. I've seen business owners receive, I received one time, <laughs> it says letter in the mail, it says I have to stop using that company name. You got to hire an attorney, spend a lot of money, and you're probably going to end up losing. So make sure you go spend a fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars and get that federal trademark. Patents are huge. You walk Shark Tank, every single shark on Shark Tank does what? Do you have a patent on that? Do you have a patent pending? Do you have a utility? Got to have patent? a patent, yeah. Got to have a patent. Contracts also will. So we sold a company actually in Texas for eighteen million dollars. They weren't making they weren't making much money, but they had eighteen patents. Contracts are huge. Manufacturing contracts, distribution contracts, vendor contracts, um, any type of contracts that have exclusivity, franchise or contracts, client contracts are the most valuable of all because buyers want to make sure that there's revenue coming in. The most valuable are the reoccurring contracts, reoccurring revenue streams and subscription models. So this will get you a much higher multiple. Celebrity endorsements are huge. We have a client that has, um, Oprah has endorsed her products. A competitor or strategic will pay a lot more money for that because their thought process is, I can get, if I buy this company, I'm in front of Oprah. <laughs> I can maybe get my other stuff endorsed by Oprah. Uh, radio endorsements. I mean, Rush Lombard used to be huge at this. You know, Rush Lombard, Glenn Beck. Unfortunately, Rush passed away. But they can only endorse one vertical at a time. Otherwise, they completely lose credibility. So if they're endorsing skincare and that skincare company continues to pay them, that's the skincare that they're always going to endorse. You follow me? That's huge placement. It's hard to get that placement. And then e-commerce businesses, we sell a lot of e-commerce businesses. So anytime you can get those top positions on Etsy, Wayfair, Amazon, et cetera, this is what we call IP real estate, databases. Databases can get you a lot of money if you keep up with it, if you nurture your clients, if they can be retargeted and repurposed. Am um, Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. And WhatsApp was not just losing money, they were hemorrhaging, <laughs> and, but they had a synergy. They had a billion users. So they paid $19 billion because they figured they could get their ROI and monetize off of, off of that purchase. So build your proprietary assets, build your multiple. Does that make sense? Software. Absolutely. Software is huge. Any type of proprietary software. Um, so the fifth P is patrons. You know, most businesses follow the 80-20 rule where 80% of their business comes from 20% of their clients. And if you have customer concentration, that can be a big problem. We um, once sold an oil manufacturing business that had 65% of the revenue tied up in the BP. We have 550 buyers. We narrowed it down to 12, 12 buyers. We got 12 LOIs. They were all concerned about customer concentration. And then we found a strategic that had similar products and services. That strategic didn't care because that strategic said, I've been trying to get in BP for years. We've been trying to get in BP for years. Now, if we buy this company, we have our in. We can get the rest of our product. We can get our other products and services in here. So this business was appraised for $9.8 million for 100%. He paid $15 million for 70%. That's 126% more than the appraised price. 
that's value. That's how you build value. We have to look for the synergies. We have to identify the synergies, identify the buyers that are going to pay for them, identify what the economies of scales are, and, and identify what overhead they can cut, you know, cut. Like we have a manufacturing business we're selling that has a distribution center. We have a buyer that's distribution all over the United States. They can cut that one distribution center, cutting a half a million dollars, you know, in that distribution, increasing their EBITDA from day one of closing a business. So that's how you increase valuation. Um, and then the last P, the most important, oh, so you want to make sure you have customer diversification, not customer, you know, uh, concentration. If you do though, I mean, we could still buy that buy. We could still bring that buyer. It just takes a lot longer <laughs> to find that that right buyer. You know, that needle of a haystack buyer. I always say. Um, and then the last piece is profits, Rick. You know, we're all in business to make money, but if you're not profitable, profits are always a problem, never the symptom. It's always the sim. It's always it's not the problem. It's a symptom of not operating on one of the other five Ps. I have clients that come to me and say, well, we should have a profit problem. I'm like, no, you have a people problem. No, you have a process issue. So prof lack of profits are never the problem. It's a symptom. That's the six Ps, and that's how we increase valuation. Which is very, very thorough. I mean, unbelievably thorough in a business. And I would suggest that anyone listening to this thinks it's simple uh, is, is, is not really given the reality of trying to maximize the return they're going to get for their business. You've got right. to put some work in, you got to hire somebody like Michelle and you allow their company to go through and evaluate. And it makes a huge difference. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I mean, just so much information and your two books are full of information as well. And I encourage people to, uh, to reach out and, and obtain those books if they're entertaining the idea of selling their business or if they're even starting a business, be aware of the exit. If people want to get in touch with you, Michelle, your organization, what's the best way for them to do it? So two things. I like to tell every, all your listeners how they can get exit rich right now and get all the goodies because we're in pre-sale. So if you buy in pre-sale, you have a lot of added value. Can I tell them that real quick? Absolutely. So they can, so everybody can go to exitrichbook.com, exitrichbook.com for $24 and 79 cents. You don't have to wait till the book launches. A book is going to launch in June. So Exit Rich will launch in June. So at ExitRichBook.com, $24.79, we'll email you the digital download immediately. Plus, we'll send a hardcover to your doorstep for no additional shipping costs for anyone that lives in the U.S. Plus, we will give you a lifetime membership in the Exit Rich Book Club. So if you like what you're hearing here, there's more video content, plus documents. Documents to run your business, documents to sell your business. We have samples of, due of, samples of operating manuals, employee handbooks, non-competes, sample due diligence checklist, sample LOI, sample purchase agreement, sample closing docs. Rick, this is all worth over $30,000 if you went to an attorney to have them recreate it. And it's not just there for your review, it's there for your document download as well. In addition, we're also giving away 30 days free membership into Club CEOs, which is an entrepreneur mastermind where we do hot seats, Q and A's and really help business owners pivot and really help business owners, you know, build that sustainable, scalable business. Also, I wanted to say Exit Rich is endorsed by Steve Forbes. He said, Exit Rich is a go mine for entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs leave too much money on the table. He all, it's also um, forward is written by Kevin Harrington, original shark from Shark Tank. And Sharon Lecter is my co-author. Sharon Lecter wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki, which you probably have heard of. New York Times bestselling author five times. And she um, is a CPA, financial literacy expert, and an advisor to many different presidents. She has written the mentor's corner after each chapter. So Brian Tracy, Tom Hopkins, Jack Canfield, Les Brown, they have all endorsed Exit Rich. And well, then I appreciate your, that. Your list, I was just going to say, too, your listeners can text Michelle to 888-526-5750. All of my websites, social media pops up. So you can follow me on social media and connect with me on LinkedIn. And our main website is SilerTucker.com. Wow. We have covered a lot of ground today and you've done a wonderful job. And again, <laughs> I've enjoyed visiting with you and look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you, Rick. It was a pleasure being with you. My husband's name is Rick. It's easy. <laughs> there we go. Thank Take you. Care. 
This is Wayne Green, your host for Radio Wayne, Folk and More. Each Saturday from 5 to 7 p.m., I'll be playing folk, singer-songwriter, Americana, blues, bluegrass, classic country, Cajun Zydeco, Celtic swing, and whatever else seems to fit. Once again, that's Radio Wayne, Folk and More, every Saturday from 5 to 7 p.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host, Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit IRLoneStar.com slash Conroe Culture. Relax with a cup of joe or your favorite drink for the Conroe Lake Conroe Chamber of Commerce Chamber Chat. The show airs on the first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. Join hosts Courtney Galley and Brian Bondi as they chat about the Chamber's events and programs for the month and invite Chamber members into the studio to talk about their upcoming events and businesses. Learn about your Chamber with Chamber Chat every first Tuesday at 11 a.m. Well, thank you for joining us today on the Weekly Business Hour, and I hope you've enjoyed the conversation with we, that we had with business expert Michelle Seiler Tucker. And I would encourage you to check out her website. Again, there's lots of information there about the number of businesses that are bought and sold information that could help you in generally. And of course, I think she probably offers some really good services for your business particularly. Uh, it, doesn't help, it doesn't hurt to have that initial conversation and find out if there truly is a fit for you and their business. And again, I want to thank Michelle for taking the time to talk to myself earlier and for being able to record the message. Hopefully, it's been enjoyable to you as well. I encourage you, put a note on your calendar to join us again next Monday right here on IRLoneStar.com at 11 o'clock when we'll have another of the Weekly Business Hour series. And look for the video podcast today on the Weekly Business Hour page at IRLoneStar.com at OneBestConsult.com or on our Facebook page later in the week. Thank you for joining us. And remember, stay in touch with what's happening in Montgomery County right here on Lone Star Community Radio. And until next week, stay engaged in your business and keep a focus on what counts to you and your business. Thanks.